fellow economics students. So, is minimum wage hike good or bad for you? Well, um, this is a discussion that goes on, especially around election time. Um, and a lot of people think that we do need a hike in the minimum wage so that people have enough money to live. Um, but this can have some unintended side effects. And so we're going to be looking at things like this today as we talk about the topic of disequilibrium. Um, announcements. I talked about this yesterday, but I'd like to remind you again that the test is on Friday, October 23rd. I will expect that you will take the test during your regularly scheduled class period. Um, you must also turn in your two, Unit 2 learning targets by Friday, October 23rd. You will want to have those ready um, to use on the test. So go ahead to the Schoology page for our class and open the uh, in the unit 2 folder econ market equilibrium practice there's a supply and demand of coffee on the first page if you can print it out please do so otherwise just write your answers on a piece of paper I'd like you to pause the video right now and complete that activity okay here are the answers how many did you get right um, and I'll let you answer that for your ABA. Um, okay, so today we're going to look at disequilibri disequilibrium. Uh, equilibrium, of course, is when we have our demand and our supply, and when they come to a point where they reach a price equilibrium, where both the sellers and the buyers agree on what the price of a product should be and how much should be sold. But what market condition might cause a pizzeria owner to throw out many slices of pizza at the end of the day? Now, this is a really frustrating thing, actually, that there is so much wasted food in the United States. And in fact, there are companies now that are taking leftover restaurant food and they're um, trying to repurpose it, whether it's if it's something that can, it can be de dehydrated or brought to a food shelf. but but really, why would they throw out many slices of pizza at the end of the day? Well, they must not have planned correctly. And perhaps there was something about the market that caused them to make too many slices of pizza. Well, they're at disequilibrium. The number of pieces of pizza that they made did not equal the amount that people were willing to buy at that price. So if the market price or quantity supplied is anywhere but at equilibrium, the market is said to be at disequilibrium. Now, there are two possible outcomes to this. There can be a shortage. Um, so this occurs when the demand for a good is greater than the supply of the good. Every once in a while, a toy comes on the market that's just really hot. I remember the year the Wii came out and um, people were just, you know, standing and staying overnight outside of Best Buy so they could get the Wii the morning that uh, the store opened. And there was a shortage, and in fact, they uh, raised the price of the Wii by quite a bit and uh, for the following deliveries. Or there can be a surplus. This causes a drop in prices as a supply for the good is greater than the demand for that good. So, um, you know, you look at the sale racks at stores, um, let's say Macy's, and the reason why they have this gigantic sale is they want to get rid of their merchandise. They have a surplus. Maybe the style they made didn't work well or whatever. So this is what this looks like. Both shortages and surpluses lead to a market with fewer sales than at equilibrium. Okay, so um, here's the question. How much is the shortage when pizza is sold at $2? Okay, so we have a demand um, way up here. And um, we have, if the supply was only 150, well, then you've got a, a, a shortage of 100 uh, pieces. Now, let's say that the seller of the pizzas, and I realize that my song quality is not good today. I'm not sure why, um, so we'll just have to live with it. But let's say that the uh, pizza maker has decided uh, to um, oops, uh, set the price at $4 per slice. Well, we see when we have $4 per slice, the demand is only 150 and the supply 
that they wanted to sell was 250. So we have a surplus or an excess supply of 100 pieces of pizza. So it's kind of how shortage and supply works. So what we're going to look at today is 2B, learning target 2B, price controls. I can analyze the market impacts of price changes and price controls. So what is a price control? It is a government imposed limit on the prices that producers may charge in the market. For example, minimum wage. Um, so there are a lot of different examples of price controls and um, sometimes the prices are controlled because they're considered to be unfair. In recent years, we've heard months actually we've heard of the incredible rise in the prices for example of diabetes medication or epipens or things that people need for their very health um, becoming inaccessible because the prices are too high do you think that the government should do something about these prices that some of you think are unfair well, that is a really important question, and not all economists will agree on the answer to that question, nor will politicians agree on the answer to that question. There are many people who subscribe to the idea that we have to let the free market work its way out, like the invisible hand, like Adam Smith talked about, and others think we need to control prices. So if we look at the price of EpiPens, uh, Mylan announces uh, the purchase of Merck's generics unit, including the EpiPen, and then we look at the price of EpiPens under Mylan. Now, it has gotten extraordinarily expensive. EpiPens, if you don't know what they are, is they are a uh, pen that you, um, it, it's actually like a, an injection that you take in order to help with an anaphylactic or allergic reaction that can actually be life-threatening. And some people, you know, there's students at Edina High School that carry EpiPens with them. There are EpiPens up in the nurse's office. And if you're somebody that does not have the income to spend $600 to carry around an EpiPen, you could potentially be putting your health at risk. So is this really fair for the uh, myelin to charge such high prices for EpiPens, knowing that it is something that is life-saving? So here are the benefits of allowing the market forces, not the government, to, to set prices. Prices reflect the preferences and circumstances of individual buyers and sellers. Decisions are made in a decentralized manner. In competitive markets, the buyers and the sellers compete um, with each other. Buyers compete with other buyers and sellers compete with other sellers. Everyone who's willing and able to buy at the market price gets the product, while everyone who's willing and able to sell at that price can sell it. Allocation decisions are made to determine which consumers will buy and use the product and which producers will use productive resources to make and sell the product. So that's a lot of words on this slide, but in the end, basically what they're saying is what I've said before, what I just mentioned, you let the in invisible hand work out what the buyers and the sellers are going to do until they reach a market equilibrium. However, um, letting the prices for goods and services be determined in the marketplace in a market-based economy is something that is not always done. And in fact, the United States and other market-based economies do regulate the price of some products. And many of us might be thankful for that. I have a family member who relies on a medication that is life-saving. Without that medication, he very well could be in a very compromised state of health. And so thankfully, his medication only costs about $60 a month. If it were $2,000 a month, that would be a real hardship for our family. Those who argue for price ceilings or floors will only be successful when they enjoy widespread public and political support or when they can inform effective special interest groups. And this is what happens when we have politicians 
and uh, other people who are working on her behalf um, set a price ceiling. In other words, the highest a good can be sold for or a price floor, the lowest a good can be sold for. All right, so what's a price ceiling? A price ceiling is a maximum price that can be charged for a good or service as set by law. It's adopted when consumers feel that prices for products are too high, though the supplier has a disincentive for a quality product. So when rent controls in New York City took place and rent was um, set at a particular price, let's say $1,000 a month, um, this would be attractive to the person that's renting, but to the person that's selling, when real estate is very expensive in New York City, what's going to happen is there's going to be a shortage of apartments for rent. So anywhere where rent controls take place, we need to create some kind of incentive for people to continuing, continue renting the apartments, uh, for, for suppliers to continue to rent the apartments. Um, during World War II, the U.S. government imposed ceilings on aluminum and steel, as an example. Um, so let's say the market clearing price or equilibrium is $600, okay? So here it is, um, $600 right here. What is the quantity demanded if a price ceiling was set at $400? So we go down to $400. Um, now, the quantity demanded over here is 400. This is the demand line. The quantity that it is available, however, is only 200. So what do we have here then? We have a shortage. We have more demand than we do supply. And that's one of the problems with a uh, market price ceiling. Um, so the result in the market is a shortage. Now, what's a price floor? This creates a surplus. This is a minimum price that can be charged for a good or service as set by law. It cannot go lower. Um, so this is adopted when some producers feel or are concerned that prices are too low. For example, Minnesota's minimum wage. Um, so we can see here the minimum wage um, is dependent on the size of the employer. Um, now, minimum wage laws are important for a, a lot of people uh, because they do provide a working wage. And what we had was a problem of working floor, poor. However, when we take a look at what happens with price floors, okay, so this is a minimum price set by the government. Let's take a look at what happens. Um, so this is our price point equilibrium, okay? Um, we have 660, four, 4 million workers, okay? Demand, supply. Let's say we set the minimum wage at 725. We have a whole lot of people that are willing to work at 725. Um, in fact, we have 6 million, but at um, 7, I think I said 625, I meant 725, but the demand from employers is, is going to be only 2 million. So this is a huge gap and it's going to create um, a huge shortage, okay? So inefficiency and secondary effects. Price controls limit mutually beneficial transactions that would otherwise occur in the market. This is dead weight loss. It's inefficient. Price controls create secondary effects, shortages and surpluses in markets, sometimes black markets, sometimes wasted resources. Back during the day of World War II, when we had rationing coupons for food, a black market developed for certain food items, and actually they were going through bootleggers who were um, selling illegal alcohol. Well, they also got into selling um, other um, grocery or food items in the black market because of the rationing that was taking place. It was inefficient. 
So take out this handout, and actually you'll find this on um, that same handout with the coffee, um, price floors and price ceilings, and I would like you to work on this. And then I would also like you to work on this as well, and these are um, going to be your um, homework for tonight. Um, and I will actually have you submit a um, picture of these on Schoology. All right, read your text. Your text explains this really well in Chapter 6. Thank you.